We are going to be taking a look at Joshua chapter, uh, chapter 1 tonight and just reading from that chapter and then I'm going to have just three quick points of application. Um, I hope this will be uh, something encouraging, something inspiring, uh, hopefully for all of us uh, tonight. <clears throat> you, uh, I assume most of us are pretty familiar with uh, Joshua and, and kind of the uh, background as we lead into Joshua chapter 1. But um, you recall that Israel had been delivered from Egypt, that Moses had led the people, the Israelite nation, out of Egyptian bondage. Uh, they wandered in the wilderness. Um, and then they are finally at a point where they're able to enter the land of Canaan land that God had promised to them, or of the three promises that were given to, to Abraham. Um, but you also recall that Moses was not allowed to enter the land of Canaan, and he had come to the end of his life, and Joshua has been selected to lead the Israelite nation into Canaan and drive out uh, the enemy nations and, and to take uh, take hold of that land just as had been promised. And so in Joshua chapter 1, we see this being put into play. And there's a, um, I think it's four times in the chapter where Joshua is encouraged to be strong and courageous. Let's read Joshua chapter 1 together. It says, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all the people, into the land that I'm giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, to the great sea toward the going down of the, the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make, you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And Joshua commanded the officers of the people, pass through the midst of the camp and command the people, prepare your provisions, for within three days you are to pass over the Jordan to go in to take possession of this land that the Lord your God is giving you to possess. And to the Reubenites, to the Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh, Joshua said, Remember the word that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God is providing you a place of rest and will give you this land. Your wives and your little ones and your livestock shall remain in the land that Moses gave you beyond the Jordan. But all the men of valor among you shall pass over armed before your brothers and shall help them <clears throat> until the Lord gives, you, gives rest to your brothers as he has to you. And they, and they also take possession of the land, and the Lord your God is giving them. Then you shall return to the land of your possessions and shall possess it, the land that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you before the Jordan toward the sunrise." And they answered Joshua, all that you have commanded us, we will do. And wherever you send us, we will go, just as we obeyed Moses in all things, so we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with us, as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your commandment and disobeys the word, whatever you command him shall be put to death. Only be strong and courageous. And so <clears throat> tonight, uh, you know, we're not talking about going into a physical battle. But there are things in our life that require us, that same thought, to be strong 
and to be courageous, to do things that society might not look at as the thing to do or the best way to handle, but it's God's ways. And so I want to think about three things tonight. First of all, I'd like to think about our families and our homes. You know, it's, it's often said, uh, you might hear something uh, to the effect that, um, you know, if, if uh, you're in a good home, that prevents a lot of problems, or um, if, the, if things were in the home the way they should be, we could not see some of the things that we see in our society. And I believe that wholeheartedly. In Ephesians, Paul writes about um, what I would call is kind of the model for a family, the way a family should function, the way a family should operate. Ephesians chapter 5, um, passage we're all, I'm sure, very familiar with. He writes, starting in verse 22, Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ of the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. The mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and the wife see that she respects her husband. Continuing on into chapter 6, we See, Paul writes, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with promise, that it, may be, that it may go well with you, and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And so Paul writes about this family unit that is this husband and wife that work together, that are one. Um honoring each other, serving each other. And we have this home the way God intended. Children that uh, are taught to honor and to obey parents, but parents that, as he writes there in verse 6, that do not provoke their children to wrath. I think about things like you know, considering what do my children need, uh, to, to go out, let's say, leave my home and, and to be individuals that, one, that God is pleased with, but that um, is an example and an influence for good in society as well, not someone that's, that I've driven away. And so tonight, in, in just thinking about this, um, I mean, this is certainly, when you start thinking about uh, the home and, and, and children, um, I guess I especially want to just make a note to those of us that are fathers. And just take a minute to reflect on that. Um, because certainly um, wives and, and mothers, uh, obviously, a major role in, in the home and family. But as a husband, as a man, that is my responsibility. And I need to take hold of that. Um, that is not something to be taken lightly. And boy, I tell you what, I don't know about you, but for me, being a, a father has been great, but it has challenged me at, at ways I never even thought of or imagined that they would. You know, it's one thing to, people sometimes kind of joke and say, it's one thing to, um, you know, have younger children, you try to keep them alive. That's kind of how I've felt when I was, um, when we were first having kids. But then some of the other things that start to come and the challenges that they have and trying to lead them and to guide them. But um, 
And it's not just about children for, for husbands, but thinking about your wives as well, our wives, and um, letting your home be a place of refuge. Uh, make it a place where you, your spouse, your children can learn, can grow, where there's uh, discipline, there's guidance, there's a safe landing place, there's love. And you know, those, don't, those things don't come by accident. We've got to be intentional. We've got to be intentional about doing that. And sometimes, as a father, you may be tempted to, you know, let something go, or, or maybe it'll improve over time. And I think I've done that, and I've been, been guilty of that before. And, man, we've got to be intentional. That's the best word that I can think of that comes to mind, is being intentional about leading your home and your family for yourself, for your wife, for your children, and the example that, um, that that can set for the church, for the community, people will pay attention. So be strong and courageous. Create, in your home, create and lead your home with God's ways. Another thing that I want us to think about is adversity. Let's turn to James chapter 2, if you'd like to follow along. You know, or I'm sorry, I said James chapter 2, James chapter 1, starting in verse 2, where James writes, Count it all joy, my brethren, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let, let him ask in faith, with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not uh, suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother boast uh, in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation because like a flower of the grass he will pass away for the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass its flower falls and its beauty perishes so also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits blessed is the man who remains steadfast in a trial for when he has stood the test he will receive the crown of life which god has promised to those who love him you know trials um are something that we all go through, we all deal with, uh, and you can think of all kinds. There's health, there's financial, there's relationships, and sometimes you might be asking, you might be going through something, you might be asking or wondering, what is God doing here? What, what's happening? Why is it happening? Why is it happening to me? What do I need to take from this? And I want to encourage all of us when we're dealing with, with trials, when things are not going the way we want them to, um, to keep pursuing things, keep pursuing the right things, keep pursuing the things of God, handling things the way that God wants us to. Don't let trials be something that's for naught. Don't let a trial be something that you just went through and you don't take something from it. When we go through trials, let's let it have something be that we can take a look at, that we can examine, that it can make us stronger, it can make us better. We might be able to relate with someone else in the future who's dealing with something similar or something the same. You can say, you know what, I had an experience once, maybe it might be of some help to you. Let, let me just share what, what I went through and, and what I did to, to deal with that. So be strong and courageous. Take on adversity with God and his wisdom. Last one I'd like to mention tonight is sin. You know, Paul says in Romans chapter 3 that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Just like trials and adversity, we all face that. And sin is something 
that obviously all of mankind has a problem with. We all sin. I'm reminded of um, some things that were said to Cain in Genesis chapter 4, in verse 5. Starting in verse 5, it says, But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you. But you must rule over it. As you're aware... Uh, Cain had brought an offering that we're told in Genesis that uh, God had no regard for. And we see this, this anger in Cain. winds up taking the life of his brother Abel. And we see this, this conversation of God coming before him. And he says um, this, or he asks some of these questions about why is his countenance fell? Why, is this, why, why does he have this look on his face? And he says, sin is crouching at the door. And its desire is you. Desire is me. We have to rule over it. You know, a similar thought is mentioned back in Romans, the sixth chapter, where Paul talks about sin he seems to be addressing the, the question of, you know, can a, can a Christian just kind of go on sinning? He says, absolutely not. Starting in verse uh, 12, 12 and 13, he says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. You know, so again, we see that idea of kind of taking ownership of sin in, in my life or, you know, uh, tempting situations. Um, and, you know, that's something that's easier, can be easier said than done, especially depending on what it is for any one individual. Uh, we all have our own weaknesses. We all might find ourselves in situations that maybe we're not quite prepared for or we're not ready for. But we need to stick to God, His Word, rely on that, seek it, His wisdom, uh, when, when we are dealing with temptation, when we're uh, having situations that... That, that come up, we're going to make mistakes. We are going to fall. We are humans. And I don't say that to uh, be uh, dismissive of, of sin, but it is, it is our nature. We are going to fall short. And you know, sometimes people, when they find themselves um, kind of in a, a, a sinful state, and that can drive them away from God. They start to think, ah, I can't do anything right, or um, and just uh, start to have a, a lesser uh, value for, for God's Word. And that's so why I encourage us not to, to do that, not to be that way, but to keep coming back. Even when we've fallen, and we make mistakes, keep coming back to God. Learn from those mistakes. And we need to understand that others sin, others make mistakes as well. And how do we handle that with each other? How do we handle that with people in the world when they have sinned or sinned against us? Um, we need to be able to relate to people, understand that sin is a condition that no man uh, is not dealing with. I think that's a, a note for, for churches as, as well. Just uh, certainly in our, in our individual life, um, but as, as churches as well. Thinking about 
um, how we how we view each other, how we view others, um, and it I feel like different times comments are are made, and and sometimes you know sinful uh, behavior. Sometimes people almost want to uh, brush it off and say, "Yeah, everybody sins," and and so it's almost like there's no standard. Uh, and then other times, sometimes we have harsh judgments upon people, maybe more harsh than we should be. And I don't think either one is necessarily right. Certainly, there may be times where sin needs to be called out, sin needs to be dealt with. Um, but think about especially the, relation, the relationship with, with Christians and being able to relate to, to others in the world, knowing that we ourselves are, are sinners. Um, and, and being able to um, confess sin to each other. And I, I got to tell you, that's a hard thing for me personally to, to think about. You got to be in the tight circle <laughs> with me to be able to uh, talk about that. I was reading an article uh, here recently that talked about uh, churches and the ability to confess sin to each other. And I think the uh, author of the article wasn't trying to say you got to you know, always get up and air your dirty laundry in front of the congregation. But, man, if churches don't have people or groups of people that we can be with and that we can share those things, it's something... I think probably needs to change with that. That's something I've been, I've been thinking about. That's an interesting thought for me. Like I said, that's for me personally. It's not easy to be able to talk to others about my shortcomings. Um, but there is certainly a strength that can be gained from doing that with, with others um, and, and sharing, not, not to, again, be dismissive of sin, but to um, be encouraging to each other about lifting each other up out of that and finding ways to be able to deal with that, to be able to fight that. A note for, for congregations as well. So be strong and courageous. Fight sin. The idea kind of came up thinking about um, this topic specifically with, with churches. And the thought came up, you know, spiritually, are we a hospital or are we a courtroom? A hospital trying to help people that are sick, or a courtroom where there's judgment. And again, sometimes there does need to be judgment. But I think it's interesting what Jesus said, and this is the last passage uh, for tonight I want to offer um, as an invitation. Mark chapter 2. <clears throat> where Jesus was with some people that the Pharisees were questioning. Um, actually, uh, I'll be starting in verse 13 of chapter 2. Uh, as he went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Verses 15. Uh, and oh, actually, I was at the right place. Sorry. Um, and as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, "Follow me." And he rose and followed him. And he said, "And as he reclined at table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, "Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners?" And when Jesus <clears throat> heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners.